It's negative. It says reprove, rebuke. That is also negative. Then it says exhort. So we see negative, negative, positive. You see, preaching is meant to be two-thirds negative and one-thirds positive. But, you know, that's honestly not really what you hear from most preachers. Most preachers love guys, people like Joel Osteen and all these popular preachers. They just say positive, your best life now. And I've heard Joel Osteen say this on Larry King where he says, I don't really like to use the word sin. You know, Kassalanan is such, a, such an offensive term. I don't like to talk about sin. I don't like to judge people. It's like you're supposed to be a man of God and you can't even use the word sin. It's like, are you kidding me? Because see, what I see in my Bible is it's two-thirds negative and one-third's positive. Now turn to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. And this theme is throughout the Bible. Because the verse we just looked at was in the New Testament. Don't they always tell you, well, you know, the Old Testament God was so mean and evil. But, you know, Jesus was just all oh, love, love, love. But I don't know about you, but that's a New Testament verse we just looked at. Right. That's not the Old Testament. That's the New Testament. But this has always been the theme throughout the Bible. Because God expects preachers to preach hard against sin. But you know, preachers don't do that in today's world. Because they want you to come, they're covetous, and they want your money. So they do not want to offend you. Notice what it says in Isaiah 58, verse 1. This is the Old Testament. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. What does it say? Cry aloud. What does that mean? It means you preach with authority. Yep. It means you preach hard. It means you're not afraid to preach the truth, but you cry aloud against the sin. You say, why? Because when you walk down the street in the Philippines, you see a bunch of men dressed as women out there. Yeah. They're wearing a dress, and you know, if you're a man of God, you need to preach against that. Right. I don't know about you, but I want to live in a country that cleans itself up. I want to get the sin out of the country. And you say, how do you do that? You do that in the pulpits here in the Philippines. Right. That is what's going to fix the problem. It's not going to be the Catholic Church. It's not going to be these cults out there. No, it's going to be Baptist churches that fix the problem. Amen. And the way we do it is not just through soul winning, but also preaching hard against sin in the pulpits. That is a requirement. Notice, cry aloud. Then it says, spare not. What does spare not mean? It means you don't hold anything back. Yep. You preach all of it. You see, every single word in this Bible is pure. Doesn't the Bible say every word of God is pure? Yep. Every single word. You mean the parts in Leviticus chapter 20? Mm. Yeah, those words are pure. Amen. The parts where it talks about the abominations and the sin and the, the various reasons for the death penalty in the Bible, yeah, those words are pure words because every word of God is pure. Yeah. Every single one. And we will not be afraid to cry against the sin and we will not spare. It says spare not. Every single thing needs to be preached. You say, why? Look, we as people are sinners. We need the hard preaching to fix our lives. And it says, spare not. Then it says, lift up thy voice like a trumpet. That goes along with crying aloud. And then it says, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Notice how it keys in on their specific sins. And look, you know, when you're at a church and you're preaching, you have to preach about the issues at your church and in your country and the area you live. Yep. It needs to be specific. Let me give you an example of something that really in the past has not been much of an issue here, but it is in America. In America, half of people are divorced. In the Philippines, nobody is divorced. But I'll tell you what, it's about to become legal. You say, why? Because pastors aren't preaching hard against that sin, yeah. and now it's about to become legal in our courts. And it's going to be an issue in this country as well. And so, you have to understand, you preach against the issues of your day and where you live. That's why he says, show my people their transgression. The house of Jacob their sins, the specific issues that they're dealing with. Go to the New Testament, Matthew 5, Matthew chapter 5. Now, we looked at Isaiah 58, verse 1, but look at any of the prophets in the Old Testament. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Look, every single one you look at, they're preaching mostly negative. Yeah. It's not mostly positive. You say, Brother Stuck here, are you a hate preacher? Well, you know, I guess I am. Mm -hmm. Because throughout the Bible, they're all hate preachers. They preach against the sins that exist. They preach hard against the sin. And they're not afraid to preach against sin. That is what you see in the Bible. You say, well, you know, I, I don't know. I think Jesus was more loving. Well, let's see what Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 27, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. 
But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, was it a sin in the Old Testament to lust after a woman? Of course it was a sin. But what Jesus is doing is making it very clear. I'm not just saying actually committing the act, but even in your mind. The thought of foolishness is sin, the Bible says. Right. And so Jesus gets very specific. You say, why is it that they crucified Jesus? They didn't like his words. They didn't like what he said. Why is it that the first sermon he preached, they tried to throw him off a cliff? They didn't like what was coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. And what you have to understand is that if Jesus Christ was around today, in this country, most people would hate his words. Yeah. They wouldn't mm -hmm. like his words. You say, how do you know that? Because they don't like my words. They don't like Brother Ace's words. They don't like words from men of, of God that are preaching the truth. And look, if they don't like our words, they wouldn't like the words of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we didn't make these up ourselves. Right. It's right here. Yeah. And so if they get mad at him, they're going to get mad at us. And so you got to wonder about the preacher that everybody loves. Look, if everybody loves somebody, maybe they're not such a great guy. Yeah. Because if Jesus was hated, we're going to be hated as well if we preach the exact same thing. That's what the Bible teaches. And in Matthew 5, we see that Jesus is preaching very negative. Did you know Jesus spoke a lot more about hell than heaven? Well, it makes sense because he doesn't want people to go to hell. And if you don't want people to go to hell, you warn them about that place. And so Jesus, you know what? He was mainly preaching negative. Now turn to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. And I'll tell you what, this is not just something for preachers behind the pulpit, but this concept should be taken outside of the pulpit when you raise your kids. You know, I'm very proud that my son just got a spanking in there. <laughs> Why? Because if he's being rebellious, you know what? You're supposed to spank him. Right. That's what the Bible teaches. And we have to teach our kids at a young age so they don't grow up and be rebellious. And see, it says here in Proverbs 23, verse 13, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Did you know that when you spank your child, they don't die? I mean, they cry for two minutes, and then they they forget about it, and then they hug you. Isn't that the way it works? You know, when you first become a parent, because we have one child, you know, a second on the way. But when we first, I first spanked my son, especially the first time, I was like, I don't even know what to do. And, you know, but then right afterwards, they hug you, and they just want to make up. You know, kids are obviously very emotional. Look, kids do not die when you spank them. But it teaches them that, you know what, there is judgment for doing wrong. And if they're being taught by their fathers and mothers that, you know what, that their father's never going to judge them for doing wrong, they're going to believe one day that their heavenly father's not going to judge them either. Yeah. And they're not going to realize the importance of keeping the rules of God. And so notice what it says in verse 14. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. You deliver your child from hell because when they realize that there's a payment for their sins and breaking rules, it's going to make them realize, wow, you know what, I've got a loving God up there. But it's also the same God that sends people to hell. Mm -hmm. Yes, God is love, but at the same time, the Bible says God's a jealous God. At the same time, God's a God that does pour out judgment upon people. And when people go to hell, the Bible says, the wrath of God abideth on them forever. Yep. Forever. Look, the people he throws in hell, guess what? He doesn't love them anymore. Mm -hmm. They're burning in hell forever. He obviously decided they deserve to go there. And so look, yes, we have a loving God, but we also have a God that preaches hard against us. And you know, he expects us as preachers to preach hard. And so go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. And so preaching is two-thirds negative. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Now, there's a problem if it's 100% negative. But there's also a problem if it's 100% positive. Yes, 100% negative is a problem, and I'm sure, I mean, it's, it's tough when you're preaching sermons to get the proper balance on stuff. Because you want to preach the sermons against sin and against false doctrine. At the same time, you still need to preach the sermons that build the people up. Because we have so many things we struggle with. It can't just all be about false prophets, because there's a million here in the Philippines. Yeah. There are so many false prophets and false churches here. And so you need the balance, and it's a tough thing to get that balance. But, you know, people like to really rip on people for always being negative. But what about always being positive? Because that's a pretty big problem as well. And in fact, being all negative is closer to the two-thirds negative than being all positive. But yet most preachers are all positive. In fact, look at the churches around town. Look at Victory. Look at CCF. And guess what? Positive. 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 You say, why? Because people like to hear good things about them. Yep. People don't like being told that they're wrong and they need to make a change. 
That is why churches like Victory are always going to be a lot bigger than a church like this. This church will never be as big as Victory. This church will never be as big as CCF. Neither will ours. It will never be that big. You say, why? Because most people like to be lied to. That's what you see throughout the Bible. Most people just want to be lied to and hear positive things. They want to come to church and get a pat on the back saying, man, you're such a good person. You're doing such a great job, man. You're just knocking it out of the park. No, you haven't read your Bible this week. No, you didn't pray this week. No, you've never led a soul to the Lord in your life. But man, you're such a good person. People love to hear that. Why? Because they don't have to do any work. And they feel very spiritual, even though they're not spiritual. But, you know, there's a remnant of people and people like us in this room. We want to hear the truth. We want to know whether what we're doing is right or whether or not it's wrong. And look, when it comes to the truth, it cannot always be positive because, you know, we have a lot of problems in our lives. And me included. I mess up every single day. And I need the hard preaching as well. Why? I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And preaching should be two-thirds negative, one-thirds positive. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. But I want you to notice something here. And it says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. And I want you to realize that when you read this verse, you're seeing that the hard preaching is not to just hurt people and destroy their lives. You're actually trying to encourage those people to do what's right. You're trying to help them fix the problem when you preach hard against sin. You know, quite honestly, it's not fun to preach against sins that are going on in the church. When there's things that you notice are a problem, those are the last things you want to preach about. You say, why? Because you don't want to offend people. You don't want to make them mad. It's honestly difficult to preach against those things. But the thing is, if you actually love the people in your room, you actually care about them. You want to help them fix the problem. See, when the Bible speaks about being a pastor or bishop or elder, these terms are synonymous, but they represent different roles. And the representation of a pastor is one that cares for the sheep. Because a pastor and shepherd are synonymous in the Bible. And look, if you're a preacher, you need to care for the people that are in your room. You need to care for the people in your church. And if you never preach, if you don't preach that the wolf is coming, if you don't warn him when you see the wolf, then what kind of a shepherd are you? And see, when you're a shepherd, when you're a pastor, you should warn them when you see a wolf that maybe they don't see. And yes, you have to preach against the issues because you care about them. And look, if they don't see the wolf, they might get kind of mad at you. If they don't see the issue, they might be upset, they might be mad, but you know what? If they're people that love the Lord, they're gonna res- it's going to resonate with them, and they're going to understand, they're going to realize it. I remember we had somebody who was just visiting our church, and you know, I, I was preaching through a, a series on the Pentecostals, and I was preaching you know, all the issues with their religion, and I remember I was preaching against the Pentecostals, and this person was just visibly moved by what I was saying, because she had been in a Pentecostal church, and she had gotten saved very recently, and she's kind of upset, I can tell. She wasn't very happy. But, you know, after the service, you know, she told the people that she was, you know, family members with, she's like, everything he said was right. And she was perfectly fine. And so sometimes the preaching comes down really hard. And look, I've been in church where the preaching comes right on my toe. It just comes down hard on you, and it's like, oh, that does not feel good. But, you know, if you're someone who loves the Lord, you're like, you know what, I need to make the switch. And, yes, the preaching comes down on everybody from time, every single person from time to time. When I write sermons, sometimes I'm like, man, this is coming down hard on me. I need to make these changes. But, you know, here's the thing about this. People that love the Lord, they want this. They want the truth. And honestly, what we're trying to do is encourage people. Look, when he preaches hard against your sins, it's not because he hates you. It actually proves he loves you. Because if he didn't really care about you, he would never preach against your sin. He would never preach against the things that you're struggling with. Why? Because all he wants is your money. The proof that he loves you is the fact that he's actually willing to preach the hard things and say what needs to be said. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6. And this is what people really just don't get because they look at preachers that preach hard against sin and they think they're very hateful people and very mean people. And they honestly seem to think that when they step outside of the pulpit... They just see somebody smoking a cigarette on the side of the street, and they just rip it from them and yell at them. That's not what they do. Actually, they actually care about those people, and they realize, you know, I preach behind the pulpit, 
But you know, first off, you're just trying to win those people to the Lord if it's random people. But here's the thing about this. The person who's the positive only preacher, they won't even say anything to sin though. Because they do not care about the people that they're preaching to. And so honestly, the people that actually are loving, the people that actually are caring, are the same ones that are going to preach against the sodomites and the pedophiles. Right. You say, why? Because they actually care about the children. Right. And they're going to warn people because, you know what, they want to keep the children safe. Yep. That's the reality. And they might seem very hateful, but in reality, they're actually very loving. That's the truth. And it says in Ephesians 6, verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And see, it comes to the same thing as parents because as we have to discipline our kids and provide admonition, if you do not do that, you're going to provoke those children to wrath if you do not spank them. You say, why? Here's the thing. If you do not spank and discipline your kids, if you do not do that, what is going to happen is those kids are going to grow up and be rebellious. And guess what? They'll get arrested because they never were taught what was right and what was wrong. And here's the thing. It's the same thing with the church. If you do not teach your members what's right and what's wrong, you will provoke them to wrath and they'll leave the church. You say, why? Because what will end up happening at the end of the day is those people in church will, will wonder why they keep struggling with the same sins. They're going to wonder why they can't seem to be motivated to read the Bible. They're going to wonder why they keep making the same mistakes. And honestly, the problem was right behind the pulpit because the pastor was not willing to preach the truth. Right. And you know what? Here's the thing. Most pastors don't care. Because honestly, you know, if you leave the church, it's fine because, you know, at a church like Victory, they got plenty of members. They don't care when you fall on rough times and you leave the church. Why? Because there's a thousand members in that church. And they don't actually care about any of their members. That's the truth. Turn to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. And so when somebody tells you that what you're doing is wrong and they're trying to help you, someone who's in authority and trying to teach you, they're not doing that because they hate you. They're actually showing that they love you. It says in Colossians 3, verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. This is a parallel verse with what we just saw. Provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And see, here is the truth, that if you don't have the proper balance on these things of love, but also admonition, whether it's behind the pulpit or whether or not you're raising kids, your kids or the members are going to be discouraged and they're going to be disheartened because they keep struggling with the same thing. Okay? That is what the Bible teaches. Now turn back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. And so we see that preaching ought to be two-thirds negative. But the person who preaches hard is actually trying to encourage their members. But I want you to notice in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, I want you to see one other thing where it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. And doctrine. What does it mean, long suffering? It basically means that you just are very patient and you're very long suffering. What this is teaching is the person preaching, yes, they preach hard, but they're very long suffering about it. What that means is if they see a member make a mistake, they don't just immediately lay down the hammer. And honestly, you have to understand when, when preachers are preaching specifically, very direct about some issue, it's because the issue has been going on for a while. It's not like it's just some small issue and it's like, man, I'm preaching a whole sermon. Now, you saw someone at church, you know, they were they were listening to rock music, you caught them. So then the next sermon, you just hammer against rock music. That's not the way it works with preachers. You know, honestly, you know, members have issues and they're not perfect. And so you're going to see mistakes from time to time. But when the preacher actually preaches against it, they're actually being long-suffering about it. And honestly, that is the nature of God as well. Because God, he will lay down the hammer on stuff, but he's very long-suffering before he does that. I find it interesting if you compare the true God that we believe in and then the false God of the Hindus, you know, Shiva, which is a, 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 a manifestation of God, they say, that Shiva is very quick to anger. That Shiva gets mad like this, immediately gets mad, but then basically just forgives immediately. That's the exact opposite of God. See, God is actually very long-suffering, but when he lays down the hammer, he lays it down. Yeah. It's the exact opposite of it. Yeah, we believe in the same God. It's the exact opposite of the Hindu God. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. And I want you to realize that when preaching comes, look, the people that preach, they're very long-suffering about it. They don't just immediately lay down the hammer. We're going to see that in the life of Paul the Apostle. That was a character trait that he had. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, 
manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering. This is a characteristic of Paul the Apostle. He was very long suffering when there were issues that had to be dealt with. He was long suffering if somebody made him mad. And preachers that preach hard against sin, they actually are very patient. They actually are very long suffering. But sometimes issues need to be dealt with. Now turn to 2 Corinthians 7. And we'll see the famous issue that Paul deals with in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If you remember in the book of 1 Corinthians, the issue was that a man was with his father's wife, intimate. Now, it doesn't really get much worse in a church than that sin. I can't even really think of anything worse except, I guess, when you have a little sodomite set or, or pastors and things like that in some of the Protestant churches that's out there or in every Catholic church. Pretty much. Right. Outside of that, though, I mean, that's about the worst thing you can really think of in church. And so this man has his father's wife. And the thing that's a problem is you expect that from human churches. You don't expect that from a church where there's people that are saved. Right. A sin that's that grievous. That's what's going on in the book of, of 1 Corinthians. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, notice what it says in verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent... For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. And so Paul says, I ripped you apart in the book of 1 Corinthians. And he said, I am not sorry for it. But notice what he said. I do not repent, though I did repent. You see, Paul actually felt bad about having to rip them apart. It's not like he took pleasure in the fact, man, I get to rip someone apart today. I am so glad that they committed sin so I can just lay down the hammer. No, actually, he says, I did repent. I did feel bad. I didn't really want to rip them apart, but it came, became an issue where I actually did have to do that. But here's the thing about this. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. What ha actually happened is that that hard preaching in the book of 1 Corinthians, it solved the problem. That's why he's saying, I don't repent. I'm not sorry. I, I did feel bad about it. I knew I had to rip you apart because of the sin, but I don't feel bad now. Why? It actually made a change in them. Yeah. They actually got, boy, I, I guess hard preaching actually works. Yeah. I mean, they say, well, hard preaching doesn't work. You need to be more loving. Try that technique. Every time you know your child cries, just give them sorbetes. Just give them some pangi magas and see what happens when they're 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. And they're going to be a really bad child. Right. That's what's going to take place. Sometimes you got to just lay down the hammer. And that's what he does in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now notice what it says in verse number 9. Now I rejoice not that you are made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance, for you are made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Now, I want to explain here verses 9 and 10, because these are very misunderstood. And people that believe you've got to repent of your sins to be saved, this is one of the main passages they're going to turn to. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. The church at Corinth, is this a Catholic church? No. Is it some cult church out there? No. It's actually a Bible-believing church. Right. It's actually a church filled full of believers. Mm -hmm. Saved people. Now, obviously, if a church reaches a certain size, there's going to be some people that are infiltrators or unbelievers or people that are new. I understand that. But the majority of people in this church were saved people in the church of Corinth. And so he's writing to people that are already saved. Because what they're going to like to do is turn to these verses and say, well, see, they repented of their sins and they got saved. They were already saved. The issue was a, a man who we call a brother, a saved person, is committing that wicked sin. That's what the issue is. The issue is that other saved people were okay with that sin being committed and nobody was dealing with it. The issue is saved people were committing wicked sins. That's what the issue is. And so notice what it says here. In verse 9, it says that he sorrowed to repentance. Now notice then what it says in verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You say, well, Brother Stucky, it sounds like they had godly sorrow, they repented of their sins, and they got saved. That is not what's taking place. Yeah. What you have to understand is these people are saved. And so what we see is two things. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And what you have to understand is even as a saved person, repentance, true godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. You say, how? Because of the fact, look at the life of King Saul. Did King Saul have godly sorrow? Did he ever make changes in his life? No, he didn't. Was he sorry? Absolutely. He had worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow means 
you basically don't make any changes. You're sorry because he got caught, but then you do the exact same thing. Godly sorrow means you actually make a change. And so, yes, King Saul had worldly sorrow, and what ended up happening to him? He had worldly sorrow, never godly sorrow. He ends up killing himself. That worked death in his life. So godly sorrow does work repentance to salvation because it will save you not only from death, but also destroying your life. Yep. Look, drinking alcohol will destroy your life. Being a drunk will destroy your life. And preaching hard against that sin, if you have godly sorrow to it, it works repentance to salvation in your life. It's going to save you from destroying your marriage. It's going to save you from destroying your relationship with your kids. It's going to save you from losing your job. It's going to save you from destroying your health. Yep. And so, yes, when you have godly sorrow, it will work repentance to salvation. This is not talking about spiritual salvation to heaven, though. These people are already saved. But at the same time, the hard preaching, it can work repentance to salvation in our lives. It can help us make the changes we need. But look, if you never preach hard against sin, nobody's going to make any changes. If there's somebody who does not read the Bible... They're not going to start reading the Bible unless they hear that sermon that says you're not right with God unless you read the Bible. That's the reality. And so honestly, we need the hard preaching. But you have to realize it's with very long-suffering nature. Now turn back to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. And so we see that preaching is two-thirds negative. And we see not only is it two-thirds negative, but it's meant to encourage it's done with a long-suffering nature, but I want you to also realize it says long-suffering and doctrine. Lots of doctrine is very important. And this is something that is very missing from almost every church. Right. And honestly, you, you could walk into Victory tonight if they have service or Sunday or whatever. You can sit through that rock concert that they have. <laughs> and you can just take a survey around the church and ask every single member of that church, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And you're going to hear 20 different answers from 20 different people. Yep. You say, why? Because no doctrine is being preached at that church. Yep. It's a gathering of people that say they believe in Christ when very few are actually saved. Yep. Very few are actually saved. At Victory, at CCF, at all those mainstream non-denominational churches, they intentionally preach no doctrine because they don't want to offend. But you know what you see here in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 is when we preach the word, there must be doctrine that is presented. And you say, why? Because we need to fellowship with people that have the same doctrine. That's the reason why. Look, you're, you're not going to invite some Catholic to get up here behind the pulpit and give his little lecture about eating the bread that turns into the body of Jesus. Why? He's got different doctrine. Right. And doctrine is very important. There's a reason why this church actually has the name Baptist in it, because that actually tells you stuff. It tells you we believe in baptism by immersion as opposed to just dropping a few little drops on your head. Look, when I was a baby, I got those few little drops in the Protestant church. Many of you, you have that same, don't, don't lie to me, you have that same <laughs> testimony. When you were a baby, you had those drops put on your head. At least, hopefully, none of you got the Orthodox where they dunk you, you know, they dunk the baby three times in the name of the Father, and then the baby goes back in in the name of the, the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. That's how they do Orthodox baptisms. Right. Because they say, hey, it's by immersion, but we still baptize babies. So they just slam those babies in three times. <laughs> look, doctrine matters. Yep. And look, you know, I understand that all of these, these churches here in the Philippines say, hey, we believe in Christ. That is a very generic term that means a million things. What do you actually believe? Now turn to 2 John 1. 2 John 1. And look, you know what? Sometimes people will call you a Protestant. Look, I'm not a Protestant. I'm not close to being a Protestant because saying you're a Protestant means you believe the Catholic Church was once right and you came out of the Catholic Church. I didn't come out of the Catholic Church. I didn't come out of the mother of Harlot's Church in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Now, I grew up Protestant, but then I got saved. Then I heard the gospel and actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, look, you know, we are Baptist around here. Why? Because we believe in eternal security. Yep. It's not just baptism by immersion. We believe once saved, always saved. We believe the word eternal means eternal. We mean, believe everlasting means everlasting. Not everlasting life unless you commit a bad sin, like suicide or murder. No, we believe everlasting means everlasting. That is the reason why we're Baptist. 2 John 1, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9. 
Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any on you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. And see, the Bible says that if somebody comes and brings you doctrine, don't receive him into your house. Now, I remember somebody showed that to me a long time ago, because I used to like to debate Mormons and things like that, because it was fun. You know, you memorize a lot of verses, you make them look like fools and things like that, but it ends up being a waste of time. But I remember somebody showed me this verse, and it was like, receive them not into your house. And I was like, I'm going to take that literally. And I was like, they're not welcome in my house. And honestly, you know, I've learned over the years that when you deal with cults, you're, you're, you're basically wasting your time if they try to debate you. Now, here's the thing. If they want to listen to you, that's one thing. But, you know, honestly, I've done this before when somebody came and knocked on, on – when I knocked on somebody's door, actually. I knocked on someone's door that wanted to argue with me, and I just quit wasting my time. And they said, hey, you came to my door. You know, you have to be willing to listen. I said, hey, when you come and knock on my door, I'll listen to what you have to say. I knocked on your door here today. And honestly, the truth is if you knocked on my door, I wouldn't listen to him anyway. I just know he's never going to do that. But, you know, honestly, the Bible says don't even receive them into your house. Now, that's true in a literal house, but how much more the house of God? Right. That you can't just let anybody get up here and preach sermons. You're not going to have some Mormon get up here and tell you about how there's a multitude of gods. Why? Because they believe something completely different. If they have a different doctrine, then obviously they believe different things. Turn to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4. See, you have to understand that our doctrine is the reason why we can fellowship. Now, I'm sure in this room, many of us, including myself, we have family members that are not believers. They do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it's Catholicism or some other religion, they're trusting in their works to get to heaven. Now, do you love them? Yes, you do. But at the same time, how close can you really be when they have completely different beliefs? I mean, honestly, what can you really talk about? We just don't believe the same things. And, you know, we, we think of family members, but also all the other people that say they're Christians out there. How can we really fellowship with them if they believe different things? I mean, we can't because we're fighting different battles. We're fighting a battle of soul winning. That's a big battle we're fighting. And when we fight the soul winning battle, we're showing people that you do not have to repent of your sins. But if somebody believes the exact opposite, it's like we're fighting a different battle. Because I'm trying to show people like that that you do not have to repent of your sins and you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Bible says, Dabba Tayong Mani Wala Kaimizu Christ. That's it. Mani Wala Long in Jesus Christ. It does not say, well, it's believe plus be a good person. It doesn't say believe and change your life. No, it's just believe. And if somebody's preaching a different message, and look, when we go soul winning in parks, there's a lot of Christians that want to meet up with us. I have an open invite to go street preaching with some non-denominational church that thinks you can lose your salvation. In case I'm a memorial circle, they're like, come on over, you're a missionary, come teach us. They're like, you can street preach with us whenever you want. And it's just like, you know, I was like, oh yeah, thanks, thanks. I just tried to act respectful so I, I didn't have them be a thorn in our side in case I'm a memorial circle. But look, all those groups just want to bring everybody together. And the Catholics say, hey, it was a big misunderstanding when we murdered 50 million people <laughs> during the Protestant Reformation and the times after. It's just a big misunderstanding. The Orthodox Church, I know we had the Great Schism. Let's just get back together. And let's just bring the Muslims with us too. Let's bring the Buddhists and the Hindus. Look, I'm not for that ecumenical movement. Right. Because if you believe different things, then you can't fellowship with one another. Yeah. If somebody believes in multiple gods, I'm sorry, they're not my friend. Now, I'm not saying that makes them a reprobate, they're certainly not going to be my best friend. I'll try to explain the gospel to them, but if they're not able to receive that gospel, they're not going to be the person I go hanging out with all the time and talk about spiritual things. Why? Because they believe different things. And doctrine is extremely important. Now, one thing that takes place is there's so few of us that believe the same doctrine that it makes you almost want to be friends with people that are non-Catholic. Because there's, th there's this thing in the Philippines that if you're not Catholic, you're on the same side. You know what I'm talking about? Basically, hey, if you're Victory, it's the same as CCF. You made it out of Catholicism. <laughs> or you're Methodist, man. You made it out of Catholicism. You're best buds. That's not the way it works. 
because there's still different doctrines being presented. And I understand very few people believe the right doctrines, but you know what? Hey, it is what it is. We're starting a new generation here. And so look, in 50 years, it's going to be different when our kids are growing up, and they're going to have lots of people to fellowship with, because churches are going to get started, and people are going to get saved. But honestly, that's just not really the case right now. Right now, there's very few churches that are preaching the same thing. Now, let's notice one other thing in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I want you to see this, where it says in verse number 2, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, where it says, in season, out of season. Now, go to verses 3 and 4. When it says in season, it's saying preach it when it's popular. And out of season, you still preach it when it's not popular. Yeah. Basically, the Word of God is preached whether it's popular or unpopular. You think of, of eating certain fruits. You know, in, in America, my, my favorite frutas is manga. San manga. I think it's the most masara, pinica masara frutas. It's the best tasting fruit. But, you know, honestly, in America, it's only in season for like two months. You know, I, I love Thai food. So sometimes I'll go to Thai restaurants back in America where my wife and I would go sometimes. And I'd always ask for mango sticky rice. Because that's like the best taste, tasting honey my in the world, in my opinion. But quite honestly, you go and very rarely did they actually have it. Why? Because it's not in season. And because if you were to eat it during that time period, it just doesn't grow well in America. It's not going to taste very good. So they just don't carry the product. Now, obviously here it's in season more often. But basically when we're saying in season, think of a fruit or vegetable that only grows during certain times of the year. You do not want to eat that fruit and vegetable in the wrong time of year. It won't taste very good. But see, when it comes to the Word of God, it doesn't matter whether it's wanted or not wanted. It's still preached. Whether it is in season or out of season, it still needs to be preached. And quite honestly, it needs to be preached more when it's out of season. In fact, the last point is this. The reason hard preaching is important is because people are rejecting it. That is why it needs to be preached. Notice what it says in verse 3. For the time will come when, the, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. And so here in these verses, it talks about people having itching ears, and basically they only want things that tickle their ears that sound good. They don't want the hard preaching. And throughout the book of Jeremiah, that's what you're always seeing. That It says literally people want to be lied to. The people want it so that the preachers are lying to them. Why? It makes them feel good. Yeah. Isn't it true that in today's world people are turned away from the truth? And, you know, it makes sense in today's world because we have the Internet, we have the TV, we have all of these things. And at a young age, these children are being brainwashed in the public schools. They're being brainwashed with the, tele the television. They're being brainwashed with the computers and all this stuff because there's anything they want now on YouTube. Look, I mean, I, there's a lot of cool things you can find on YouTube. There's great preaching you can find on YouTube. But quite honestly, 99% of things on YouTube are, are, are garbage. And honestly, kids are seeing things that they ought not to be seeing at a very young age on YouTube. And the world thinks it's fine. They will condemn the hate preacher, but they're allowed to see anything they want. All kinds of scandalous things that are things the Bible says are supposed to be between a man and a wife, and yet kids openly see that on YouTube at the age of five and six years old, defiling young kids' minds. But you know, people, they want to reject the truth of today's world. They want things that actually sound good to them. And quite honestly, because we have a generation of people that don't know the truth and are rejecting the truth, the hard preaching needs to be there even more to preach against them. Turn to Isaiah 30. Isaiah 30. Now look, if, if, if you walk down the street here in the Philippines and, you know, every lady just looked very conservatively dressed with a, a long dress and every man looked like a man. All the men had short hair and all the ladies had long hair. They looked very godly. They're all carrying Bibles. Then guess what? The preaching would be a lot more loving. You say, why? There wouldn't be so many things to preach against. Yeah. But that's not what you see when you walk down the street. Look, I remember when I, I really became an independent fundamental Baptist about 15 years ago, and I started to listen to preaching, and you'd hear preachers from the past really preach hard against going to the beach. That was like a big issue. Because they said people are dressed wrong at the beach. They're dressed in mini, they're dressed in bathing suits and all the stuff that's inappropriate. But in today's world, they're dressed like that on the street here. And it's just like you can't go anywhere and avoid it. See, there was a day when there was like a certain place where people were dressed basically where they're naked, according to the Bible. But now it's everywhere. 
And it's like, you know, honestly, you can't just put yourself in a bubble. you got to go to Robinson's to get your groceries or the market. And guess what? You're going to see people dressed pretty scandalously. That is the world we live in. But, you know, that's why we need preachers to preach hard against it. And notice what it says in Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. And see, God is angry because there's people that just do not want to hear the law of the Lord. They don't want the commandments of God. They don't want to know what the Bible says. Notice what it says in verse 10. Which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. The Bible speaks about people that would say, hey, we don't want things that are rough and hard. Just preach unto us nice, smooth things. Just prophesy deceit. Just lie to us. Just tell us that we're a good person because, you know, we, we really are emotional about God. Even though we're a drunk, even though we're a drug dealer, even though we murdered someone, you know, hey, it's, it's fine, it's no big deal. Even though we're committing adultery on our spouse, just, just lie to us. Just make us feel like, you know, hey, I, I put in a lot of money in the offering plate, so that's okay if I just commit these wicked sins, right? Isn't that the way it is? See, that is why people like churches like that, the non-denominational fund centers like victory, and that's why there's this symbiotic relationship. You say, why are these pastors just intentionally lying to people? They're intentionally lying to people because there's people that want that. They need each other to survive because the person that's really wicked is perfectly willing to just commit any manner of sin and feel spiritual by putting in a lot of money in the offering. Plate. And so basically, people that have a lot of money love churches like victory. Where do all the actors go to church? <laughs> I don't, they don't go to our church. They go to your church. I didn't think so. You're not going to see. You're not going to see Vice Gondo walking into this church. Not He's not going to walk into our church either. He's not going to be welcome. But look, people like that, they're not going to like our kind of church. They like the churches where they can commit sins and be a bad person, and they're willing to put in a lot of money. And they put in a lot of money because it makes them feel very spiritual, especially as the preacher is talking about how, man, just always talking about money. A five-part series on just money. Money, money, money. Anniversary, man, let's just talk about money, money. Money part one, money part two, money part three. And look, you know what? Those sorts of churches, they attract people with a lot of money. Right? And they also attract people that don't love the Lord, never go soul winning. They have a 1,000 members, and they win less people to the Lord than this church wins in the world. And honestly, they probably have less people saved than a church like this. I mean, there's very few people that are saved in churches like that. And look, I wish it weren't the case. I wish that most people at Victory and CCF were saved, but it's not the case. Most of them aren't saved. They believe in a different gospel. That's the reality. And they would have said in verse 10, they say prophesy deceits, and these have a symbiotic relationship. Basically, there are plenty of people that are false prophets that are willing to get up and just lie. Why? Because they get a lot of money. It's good for them. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4. But do you really believe that it's ever been any different? I mean, what we're seeing in the Bible is that during this time period, this is a real issue. People lying. That wasn't just something in the Old Testament, though, where it says prophesy deceits. It's the same thing in today's world. See, how do you know that? Because the Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. Yep. Nothing has changed. The vast majority of prophets have always been false prophets. It's always been like that. Whether it's in the book of Isaiah, whether you go to the minor prophets, whether you go to the New Testament... Look, who did Jesus preach against the most in the Bible? Was it religious people or unreligious? Religious people, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Why? Because he's very mad at false prophets that are deceiving him. Yeah. And if he was around today, guess what he'd be preaching? You say, how can you name all these names? Because if Jesus was around, he'd be preaching against yeah. all those same churches. Right. Because they're preaching false gospels. They don't love the Lord. They, they, they don't do anything in these churches. You, you go to the mall and you hear them from like a mile away. Just The, the floors are just bumping and shaking. <laughs> I asked my wife one time. It was after our church was over. And we went out to get something to eat. And I was like, what is that sound? And then she said, oh, it's CCF. <laughs> I was like, man, I thought it was like a rock concert. I mean, I did. I thought it was like a rock concert. I was like, what in the world is that music? And it was CCF singing some Christian song. That's the world we live in. 2 Timothy 4, verse 5. The Bible reads, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The Bible says endure afflictions. 
Why does he have to warn him to endure afflictions? Because if you're a man of God, you will be afflicted. You will be persecuted. Right? It's just the reality. Why? Because people don't like the words we're saying. Now, in this room, you like these words. That's because you love the Lord. You have to realize that you are an exception. Because when we hear things like this, we say, man, the word of God was preached. We're learning the Bible. Amen. We're encouraged. We're edified. Most people, though, would be horrified by the words that are being preached tonight. They'd be horrified by it. They'd be like, man, how is this person even welcome in our country? That's the way they would feel. Why? Because they don't want to know the truth. Because they want to be lied to. That's the reality. But see, the Bible says endure afflictions because if you're someone who's living for God, you will go through afflictions and persecutions. And I, I want to warn you, it's not just going to be the person preaching the sermons, though. Just being attached to a church like this will get you a lot of those same persecutions. You will have family that will reject you. You will have friends that will reject you. You will have people at school that will make fun of you. People at work will make fun of you. But you know what? Jesus was crucified. That's not really that much to ask to be made fun of from time to time. That's not really that big. That, that's what the Bible calls a light affliction. Look, they, the Catholic Church just murdered people during the Dark Ages. We're not getting murdered here in the Philippines. We're just getting made fun of. It's not really that big of a deal. It says endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. One of the big things when it comes to being a pastor, a preacher, evangelist is when you're doing the work of soul winning and getting people saved. But honestly, the direct context is more about preaching the word than it is going soul winning in these verses. And so, yes, the soul winning is vital in every church. That is a, a, a real church needs to be soul winning. But honestly, every church needs to be doing more than just soul winning. They need to be preaching the word with authority and not holding back. That is what the Bible teaches. And so let me say this. that You know what? You should be happy that you have a church here that maybe not every sermon makes you feel really great. And maybe you feel guilty all the time. But you have a man of God that's actually preaching the truth to you. He's actually doing what very few preachers do. And that is he's preaching the word. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here in your house this evening. And, and uh, ask you to help us to apply these words to our lives, God. I ask you to uh, help me as well. and ask you to bless this church and help them at their anniversary weekend. Help them with all the persecution they're going through, God. And ask you to uh, you know, guide them in the right way, God. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.